Okay, hi everybody. Um, <clears throat> hope you had a lovely weekend. Welcome to 2022, if that means anything to you out there. Um, and uh, why don't we continue learning the Kuzari? We'll spend a few minutes on the next couple of paragraphs and then we'll learn something about Parsha's bow today. Okay. So um, we are on the bottom of page 384 in the uh, Feldheim Kuzari. Okay, I hope everyone has access to a copy. Um, I haven't sort of an, uh, promoted the book in a long time. So let me just point out that uh, the Feldheim Kuzari is a readily available translation. You can order it from feldheim.com, from Amazon, uh, or from, uh, you can find it at your local Judaica store, usually. Um, and, um, and it's the version that we're using. And uh, I hope it uh, is helpful for you. So we're in the uh, sort of towards the end of the third essay, the third Ma'amar of the Kuzari. We should be finishing within the next few weeks, uh, the third Ma'amar. And our, uh, our discussion has taken us into Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's defense of the oral tradition of Torah Sheba Alpeh. Uh, and really this section is the only part of the Kuzari where Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is defending Judaism from its internal detractors. Um, and what I mean by internal is that there were sects of Jews uh, in the 11th century and the 12th, early 12th century when Rabbi Yehuda Halevi was writing this, who believed that, uh, uh, that the Bible, the Torah was real, the Torah was God-given, but did not believe in the, um, in the authority of the rabbis from the period of the Second Temple and onward, did not believe that they were faithfully transmitting the, um, the law and that they had um, fabricated a lot of the transmission, this oral transmission. And so Rabbi Huda Halevi has spent the last several pages defending this oral tradition against the sect of Jews called the Karaites. And uh, as part of that defense, what we're seeing it towards the end of uh, this section is his uh, focusing in on different portions of our oral tradition, which are reflective of the greatness of the rabbis who were the authors of this tradition, you know, who are quoted throughout the Talmud and the Mishnah and the Midrash. Uh, so um, part of that uh, is to show that these rabbis were endowed with tremendous character, were people of great integrity, of great holiness, to the point where they had near prophetic experiences. Um, that's where we are. We're on page 384, subparagraph six. And he says that our oral tradition also relates um, that certain sages had spiritual visions. It was not unusual for such saintly people to have such visions. Some of these visions unfolded in their own minds, and they were able to achieve this because of their great intellects and purity of thought. Others were real scenes, which actually existed outside of their minds, similar to the actual visions that the prophets had. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to point out that it's quite clear that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi understands certain biblical passages about uh, prophetic images as ontological realities. And what I mean by that is uh, that if a prophet is depicted, let's say in the Torah, as having a vision of an angel, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi understands it at face value, that an actual angel with some kind of physical visage, some kind of visible appearance in the outside world, in the external world, actually appeared to the individual, such that if there were a camera set up uh, uh, to film uh, a great tzaddik in Tanakh having a conversation with that angel, the angel would be captured on camera, right? So when the three angels, for example, visited Avraham after his Brit Milah in Parshas Vayera, and they came to visit him, so that was a real event. That was an actual event that there were three men, uh, three angels in the form of men, and so forth. 
when the Torah describes Akedas Yitzchak and an angel stayed Avraham's hand, it means that Avraham actually felt the external grasp of an angel staying his hand and stopping him from slaughtering his son Yitzchak. Um, and all he's adding to that is that just like these visions of angels happened in the real world to the great uh, righteous figures of the Tanakh, in similar kind, they quite often occurred to our great sages. There are multiple stories of our sages being visi visited by Eliyahu Hanavi, by the angel Elijah, who's known as the Malach Habris, is the angel who appears at, who comes in and uh, endorses every bris mila. Um, but they actually had these actual visitations from Eliyahu and had this visible uh, uh, being come and visit them. The reason why I mention this is because this is not at all simple. Maimonides, the Rambam, does not subscribe to this view that uh, images that are depicted in Tanakh about actual experiences, according to the Rambam, almost always these are in the form of a vision in one's mind, that they are epistemological and not ontological, to use the fancy terminology. They occur in the mind, they do not occur in the outside world. So for the Rambam, even the, you know, the, the Akedat Yitzchak did not, it was not a real event. It may have just occurred in Avraham's mind. Whether or not Avraham actually brought his son on the Akedah, which shocking as that may be, for Maimonides, that may have just been in a vision. Uh, and certainly he also understands that when the three men came to him, the three angels came to visit him, that was also in a vision. So take that as you will, that the Rambam is the one who's the radical interpreter. Rabbi Huda Halevi takes it at face value, and therefore he feels it completely consistent to say that the rabbis had these kinds of, of uh, experiences too, of being visited by people who that looked like people, but were in reality angels and were subject to miraculous phenomena. And uh, he then continues, and he says, the heavenly voice, the bat kol, also continued during the Second Temple era. The Talmud talks about the bas kol in many uh, different places. Um, probably one of the more famous ones is the bas kol that emanated after the rabbis debated for a very long time as to whether the Academy of Shammai or the Academy of Hillel would be the prevailing academy that would determine issues of legal questions. And a Baskol came out and said that the law is always like Beit Hillel, with rare exception, of course, but it was a Baskol, it was a heavenly voice that emanated forth that pronouncement. And it was something that the sages at the time who were deliberating heard and, Re and Rabbi Huda Halevi takes this literally, and he says that this was a voice that they heard that told them that they needed to paskin, to, to give the psak halacha, uh, that the law is like Beit Hillel. Another famous example uh, is the story of, of the Tanur Shel Achnai that many of you may be familiar with, the story in Tractate Bava Metzia, where Rabbi Yahushua and Rabbi Eliezer are involved in a disputation about a technical aspect of law. And Rabbi Eliezer kept wanting to prove that he was right and produced miracle after miracle that even nature endorsed his ruling on the matter. And finally, he said, if I am right, let them prove it from the heavens. And at that point, a heavenly voice, a baskol, came out from heaven and said, the law is like my son Eliezer in all places. And Rabbi Yehoshua said, that when we have a clear majority rule uh, against Rabbi Eliezer, even if a heavenly voice emanates and says that we should go like Rabbi Eliezer, we don't have to listen to the heavenly voice because lo vashamayim he, it is not in heaven. The Torah is not meant to be legislated by God. Once he gave it to mankind, we legislate law. And if the, there's a clear majority of rabbis who come out on the side of uh, of the way I am ruling, says Rabbi Yehoshua, that the Tanur Shalachnai is one, of one halachic status, then we do not have to hearken to even the heavenly voice. But that's, those are examples 
of where Rabbi Yehuda Halevi takes this quite literally, that a voice thundered from heaven, the rabbis heard it, and it seems to him, he says, this was a level just below prophetic visions and speech. So it's not exactly like divine inspiration of prophecy, but it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty darn close, okay? And then uh, we turn now to page 385, um, and where he starts off the paragraph with what Rabbi Yishmoel said should not be considered far-fetched. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you now to look at the Talmudic passage that Rabbi Huda Halevi is quoting. And the reason why it's a little bit confusing, and I have to give that disclaimer, is because, hold on one second, uh, is because the version in our Talmud is not Rebbe Yishmoel, but rather it's Rabbi Yossi. So we're going to see that story now, where Rebbe Yehuda Halevi's version of that Gemara was Rebbe Yishmoel. Our version, as you can see on your screen, is Tanya Omar Rabbi Yossi, if you can see that. So we'll read the English uh, from, from the Safaria Talmudic translation. It's from Tractate Brachot, page 3a. Um, the Gemara relates a story. It was taught in a Braita, which is a Mishnaic text. It's a text compiled at the same time as the Mishnah, that Rabbi Yose said, I was once walking along the road when I entered the ruins of an old abandoned building among the ruins of Jerusalem in order to pray. I noticed that Elijah of blessed memory came and guarded the entrance for me and waited at the entrance until I finished my prayer. When I finished praying and exited the ruin, Elijah said to me, deferentially as one would address a rabbi, greetings to you, my Rebbe. Shalom Alecha Rebbe. I answered to him, greetings to you, my Rebbe, my teacher. And Eliyahu said to me, my son, why did you enter this ruin? Okay, we got someone who's got So I said to him, he say, ask me, my son, why did you enter this ruin? So I said to him, uh, in order to pray. And Eliyahu said to me, you should have prayed on the road. And I said to him, I was unable to pray along the road because I was afraid that I might be interrupted by travelers and would be unable to focus. And Eliyahu said to me, you should have recited the abbreviated prayer instituted for just such circumstances. Rabbi Yossi concluded at that time from that brief exchange, I learned from him three things. Number one, I learned that one may not enter a ruin. Now, why do you think you cannot enter a ruin? The reason is, is because it's dangerous. If you enter into a dilapidated building, you are risking your life because who knows at any time that building might collapse. And that was why Eliyahu was reproaching me, he says, because he felt that it was not proper for even a tzaddik to tempt fate. Number two, I learned that one need not enter a building to pray, but he may instead pray along the road. And number three, I learned that one who prays along, along the road recites an abbreviated prayer so that he maintain his focus. Now, after that introductory discussion with Eliyahu, Eliyahu said to me, what voice did you hear in that ruin? And remember, he's praying in a place where ostensibly this was a holy place of Jerusalem that had been destroyed by the Romans, and it was probably either a synagogue or some uh, holy place in Yerushalayim. So Rabbi Yossi said, I heard a heavenly voice, a batkol, like an echo of that roar of the Holy One, blessed be he, cooing like a dove, a very, very soft voice, and saying, woe to the children, due to whose sin I destroyed my house, burned my temple, and exiled them among the nations. In other words, he hears God lamenting, almost like a, a cry, okay? And Elijah said to me, by your life and by your head, not only did that voice cry out in that moment, but it cries out three times each and every day. Moreover, any time that God's greatness is evoked, such as when Israel enters synagogues and study halls and answers in the Kaddish prayer, Yehoshamei Rabbah, may his great name be blessed, the Holy One, blessed be he, shakes his head and says, happy is the king who was thus praised in his house. When the temple stood, this praise was recited there. 
But now how great is the pain of the father who exiled his children and woe to the children who were exiled from their father's table as their pain only adds to that of their father. Okay, so that's the, the, Tal the Talmudic passage with a little bit of inserted commentary from the Safaria editors. Okay, so um, basically what Rabbi Huda Halevi does, he says um, that he quotes this Gemara. He says, and he said, it should not be considered far-fetched that Rabbi Yossi had such a vision that he heard a heavenly voice cooing like a dove or other sayings like this, where the rabbis hear heavenly voices. If you recall a few weeks ago, we also had a passage of Rabbi Shmuel, the high priest, entering into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur and asking for a bracha, remember? And, and we had him, Rabbi Huda Levi, analyze that passage as well, which seems to anthropomorphize God. And essentially what Rabbi Huda Levi is saying is that don't be shocked by these kinds of anthropomorphic passages which depicts God as a father who is lamenting the loss of his children. He says, from the visions of Moshe and Eliyahu, we know that such things are possible. And since this story comes to us from a trustworthy tradition, it makes sense to accept it. The next part of that story, where God said, woe is me for I have destroyed my home. Well, such a passage can be compared to such Torah statements as God regretted. This is now at the end of Parsha's Parshat Bereshit, where the Torah says that God was saddened and regretted having had created man and decided that he needed to destroy man, but he was still saddened in his heart. These are all meant figuratively because God is above human emotion. But the point is that there's this anthropomorphization of God, and Rabbi Huda Halevi says this is not a challenge to rabbinic tradition. You find these kinds of ideas of God appearing to his prophets in the guise of some kind of, of, of uh, having some kind of facade of humanity, communicating directly with, uh, in a prophetic vision. And you also have God expressing human emotion, even though we not know that God is above emotion. It's meant figuratively, because of course, God has no remorse. God always has um, omniscience and has four vision understands what's going to happen in advance of it happening and so it's not possible for really God to have any kind of guilt or remorse over something that has happened in the past okay so that's really consistent with uh, with everything that is that is uh, that Rabbi Yehuda Levi has set up until now that the rabbis had this near prophetic power that such that the stories that appear in Torah Shabbat al -Peh, in many ways mimic some of the stories that appear in Tanakh, uh, where God appears to people, has direct uh, conversation with them, and presents himself in very human terms. Okay, now uh, the, the, the next paragraph, he says that some of the Agadah is allegory, and it is deliberately obscured because of its mystical content. So, whereas up until now, he has not found it necessary to suggest that anything that we found in the oral tradition up until now is meant allegorically, but rather can be understood quite literally, that when Rabbi Yossi entered the ruin, he actually heard God's voice, and he actually had a conversation with Eliyahu Hanavi and related to him what he had heard. All of that can be taken literally, because, um, because he could have actually had that vision. But there are other times when there are more perhaps outlandish stories that are depicted in the, our sages writing, such as some of the Tanoim perhaps flying or doing other kinds of outer body, out of body experiences and the like, which may be interpreted allegorically. And some of these stories are deliberately obscured or their statements are deliberately obscured because of their mystical content. Such material provides no benefit to the general populace and it was meant to be studied and explored by only a select worthy few, which may amount to only one person every generation or every few generations. And here what Rabbi Huda Halevi is pointing out is that there are multiple layers of complexity in our oral tradition. It's, you know, it's quite interesting. Uh, the Rambam in his introduction to Moren Nevuchim points out the very same thing about the passages of Tanakh. 
Um, uh, there is a passage in the book of Mishle, in the book of Proverbs, which says, Tapuche zahav b'maskuyot kesef, davar davur al ofnav. Uh, basically, what that passage means is that there was a certain kind of artwork which still exists to this day where the artist would make a sculpture and would conceal uh, a golden sculpture uh, behind a, a lattice work of silver. Um, and uh, there were different ways of doing this, but the purpose of obscuring the gold sculpture behind silver was that the casual observer, when he would pass by the artwork and would not study it carefully, it would look one way. And then when the observer would wish to spend a little bit more time to study the artwork more closely and more carefully, he would look through the, the silver lattice work and he would notice, wow, what, a, what an exquisite golden sculpture is behind the silver lattice work that is covering it, that is the facade. Now, why would artists uh, decide to depict a, a piece of artwork that way? So I want you to think about that for just a second. There is such a, um, th there is a certain um, attitude that an artist might have towards something that he wishes to depict, which is very dear and precious to him or to her. And they may wish to cover it up to the general public, only making it accessible to those rare individuals who have a true appreciation of art and are willing to take the time to study the art work carefully. In other words, if you're just a person who likes just sauntering through a museum and not carefully studying the artwork, I want my artwork to look one way to you. But if you're a person who has a finer appreciation of art, then I want there to be something more detailed that you would not catch as the casual observer. And that's the way King Solomon describes the Torah itself. He describes the Torah as something that is multi-layered um, deliberately for that reason, because Hashem uh, uh, wants to obscure certain passages, only allowing them to be truly revelatory to the person who wishes to take the time to study carefully, to develop one's intellect carefully, and to really appreciate the deeper message. So there's an external message, that's the silver lattice work in the front. And then the golden sculpture behind that um, is only revealed to someone who is more careful about the way that they study things. And uh, what Rabbi Yehuda Levi is telling us is that Torah Sheba al is the same way. That there are many things that are contained in, um, in the Talmud and in the Midrash that for the casual observer are read one way, and for the more serious student means something completely different. And it's for that reason that a casual reader of the Talmud, if he takes the, the accounts of the Talmud literally, will think that perhaps the words of the Talmud are provincial and don't, or, or silly and don't really have any serious depth or meaning. And that's what he's trying to dispel is that no, if you see a passage in the Talmud that seems outlandish or seems uh, simple-minded or seems uh, primitive, uh, try to appreciate the fact that uh, there's a much deeper reason for that. There's a, I'll just give you just one example of literally hundreds, okay? Rav Sheshis made a comment uh, in, in Tractate Shabbat. He said when, and I've probably quoted this to you before, he said, uh, he said, when I was poor, I never ate vegetables. And when I was rich, I never ate vegetables. He says, when I was poor, I never ate vegetables because when you eat vegetables, it just makes you hungry. And when you're poor and you have no, nothing to fill your stomach with, vegetables will only make you suffer more. And when I was wealthy, I never ate vegetables because... Now that I had plenty of money, I could buy meat instead of vegetables. I'd rather fill my stomach with meat instead of filling it with vegetables. 
Now that's the whole statement of Rav Sheshis. And then when you read that statement of Rav Sheshit, it almost sounds like uh, he's just <laughs> giving you some sort of chewing the fat and telling you some, some anecdote about his life and why he has always eschewed the eating of vegetables. It doesn't sound like a, pretty, a healthy diet, not a lot of fiber in there, but he doesn't care. He's talking about, you know, wealthy people, poor people. Now, of course, if you understand that it's meant allegorically, then Rav Sheshit has nothing to do with wealth or poverty. He has nothing to do with vegetables. What he's talking about, of course, is when I was poor in knowledge, there were certain types of knowledge that I consumed and other types of knowledge that I didn't consume. But when I became wealthy in Torah knowledge and I became a great scholar, I still eschewed the eating of vegetables, which is a reference to external studies, to perhaps, let's say, the study of philosophy, which is the way some commentaries understand it. He said, because why would I want to take time away from my regimen of Torah study, uh, which is the meat of life, uh, which has so much richness in it, and in, and forsake that to eat the vegetables of life, which are the which are, you know, the, the 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 philosophy texts. So that's one way of understanding it. But there are so many passages that are like that that when you look at them at the surface, they seem to be silly or fanciful, or really providing no valuable lesson. But when you have to, when you when you pour into them deeper and you look through the silver lattice work in the facade you see a beautiful golden sculpture. And that's what uh, Rabbi Huda Levi is making reference to over here. I, and I guess before we finish our discussion uh, of this section today, we'll, we'll, we'll hold it here. Um, and we'll, we're gonna give some more examples of some passages of the Talmud and of the Midrash, which seem to be fanciful or outlandish. And Rabbi Huda Levi will explain them just as giving examples. Um, let me just conclude by saying that uh, there's a lot of conversation today about emunat chachamim, about how much of our faith should be vested within the wise men of our own generation, especially in light of some of the unfortunate events that occurred in the news recently. And you know, you'd have to be under a rock not to know what's been going on over the last week or so, um, uh, you know, with news from Israel about, you know, someone who was living in the daylight and perpetrating a lot of horrible things within the religious community in Israel. Um, and so, um, and the question then becomes, what about all of the rabbinic leaders who gave this person cover and uh, defended him and uh, did not come to the defense as quickly as we might have thought to those who were the victims of this person's actions? Um, it's important to note that uh, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is not defending every single rabbinic leader in every single generation. He is referring specifically to the oral tradition of his time. Now, we also know that Yiftach Bidoro Kishmuel Bidoro, that we have to appreciate that even in generations where there's been a great decline in rabbinic scholarship and, and righteousness, uh, every generation has to look towards its rabbinic leaders for guidance, but every generation has different types of rabbinic leaders, and it's sometimes not easy to discern who the rabbinic leaders are going to be. Uh, the, the Mishnah does say, harav, make for yourself a teacher, uh, but that doesn't mean necessarily that the teacher of the 21st century is someone who should guide you in every single aspect of your life. Um, a teacher simply means someone who you view as a mentor, who is wiser than you, who can provide you with perhaps insights into the human condition based on a lens of Torah that you might not have arrived at on your own. A teacher is also someone who could tell you what the correct halachic practice is, but that doesn't mean that the role of the teacher is there to guide you ev in every single uh, aspect of the human experience. And it's something that perhaps I believe that sometimes people make a mistake, is that they vest too much power and too much authority within our rabbinic leaders, and then we set ourselves up for great disappointment when those great rabbinic leaders end up not doing what they, we feel they should have done. And one of the ways that uh, a person can avoid that type of disappointment is being you know, quite, quite honest about what their expectations of their rabbinic leaders are. 
So with that, unless someone would like to comment on that, I'm going to go on to the to the Parsha section of our discussion for today and talk about Parsha's bow. Everyone has the opportunity to unmute themselves. So if anyone would like to say anything, uh, or if I'm looking at the Facebook screen, if anyone would like to comment on the live chat, you're more than welcome to do so. Okay, if not, we'll just go on. Um, I'm going to uh, bring up my screen now, my another screen now. Let's see. All right, let's see here. Uh, give me one sec, please. There we go. Okay. I hope you can all see the screen that starts on the top with uh, Parsha's bow. Is man essentially good? That's our question. Um, and you'll see why this question is pertinent to a passage in our Parsha. I'd like to analyze a machloket that appears between two great sages, Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish. We'll talk about them in just a second, but before we do so, Let's take a look at the passage from Parshas Bo. This is right before the plague of the firstborn. This is the climax of the plagues. Uh, and if I was to ask you to characterize Moshe's encounters with Paro, um, Moshe came to Paro. He warned him. He said, listen, if you don't send my let my people go, uh, God's going to bring a terrible plague upon your people. It's really to your advantage because God is going to let loose and is really going to wreak havoc in your society. And then Paro would either relent or his heart would be hardened, uh, and, and then he would relent and then take it back. But we never see Moshe get emotional with Paro at any given point. Moshe seems to be quite stoic and in control of his emotions. And yet, at the very, very end, right before the plague of the firstborn, we do see Moshe revealing his emotions for the first time in his conversation with, with Paro. And where is that? That's in chapter 11, verse 8, where Moshe said to Paro, all of your servants are going to come to me. They're going to run to me when they see their children, their firstborn children dying. They're going to come down bowing to me, and they're going to beg me. Leave you and the entire nation at your feet. And then I will leave. And the Torah records, And he left Paro's presence in anger. Left Paro's presence in anger. Now, the, the commentaries grapple with why is it only now that Moshe is displaying anger? Why did he not display anger after Paro refused after the first plague, after the second plague, after the third plague, etc.? Why only before the plague of the firstborn? Now, it's altogether possible that Moshe's anger was out of his own frustration that he was actually coming as an executioner to so many innocent children. And that in itself is a course of a, a, um, a cause of him becoming upset. And yet, I think that we have to penetrate a little bit deeper than that, because Moshe certainly viewed his role as God's emissary. And as God's emissary, he needed to keep his emotions in check and realize that everything that was happening was by the word of God. And he needed to fairly represent to Paro what. God's position was towards Paro. And uh, if, if we take that as our premise, I wanted to um, share with you what we saw two parshiot ago at the very beginning of the story in Shemot chapter four, when God first reveals himself to Moshe, God uh, uh, portends to Moshe that. This, there's going to be lots of suffering in Egypt, which will result in the death of the firstborn. Va'omar elecha, that I, I, I want you to tell Paro 
that the Jewish people are my firstborn, my firstborn Israel. And I have repeatedly said to you, Shalach et bini viabeni, send, let go my let go of my son, my son Israel, so that he can serve me. And you have repeatedly refused. God is saying, This is what's going to happen. And therefore, he anochi horeget bin And therefore, because you have refused, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. So God had told this to Moshe in advance that all of this is going to happen. And that only sort of piques our curiosity. If Moshe saw all of the events unfolding exactly as God had predicted it, why would Moshe get upset at this particular moment? And the, um, the Sfarno in his commentary says over here that there is a, a fundamental difference between the first nine plagues and the 10th plague. The first nine plagues um, were not a punishment to Paro. He says, if you take a look at his commentary, he says, Ki hamishpata eloki shuhu mida keneged mida. This is the first thing that we want to set down that we learn from this whole story is that God is a just God who punishes evil measure for measure. Ka'amro u ch'orach ish yamtsi enu. As it says in the book of Job, that according to man's path, does God uh, provide man with recompense. Ki omnam makat b'chorot levada, ha'yita l'mishpat onesh l'paro mikol hamakot. He says the only plague, the only experience that was presented to Paro and Egypt that was an actual punishment, which was wet retribution, that was the plague of the firstborn. Aval sha'ar hamakot, he says the other plagues was not retribution, but rather trying to convince the people to repent. Hey guys, I've turned the Nile into blood. This should be a lesson to you, that you have made the Nile bloody uh, because you've thrown Jewish children into the Nile. You need to repent. Or, hey Egyptians, I've presented your entire civilization with frogs to show you that you are not in charge, that you can have a nuisance that penetrates every single uh, orifice and, and nook and cranny of your homes uh, to show you that you are not the bosses of your lives like you thought you were. Uh, and that is to incentivize you to repent from your uh, 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 arrogant position of control right? God doesn't want people to die. God always, at every juncture along the first nine plagues, gave the Egyptians the opportunity to repent. Had only they had enough wisdom to repent to Hashem. And the reason why God wants this is because God loves human beings. That if, if only they would have repented out of a realization of the great awe and love that they should have for their creator, this type of tshuva would have reached up to the highest level of heaven and would have reached God's own throne, as it were. And that would have immediately granted favor uh, uh, in God's eyes for the Egyptians. And God would have, would have saved, would have saved them. And we'll skip to the end. He says, <laughs> But once the first nine plagues transpired, the remaining two events, namely the plague of the firstborn and the splitting of the Red Sea, those two were retribution. Already at that point, because there was repeated refusal to repent, God brought the plague of the firstborn. This was death, whereas the first nine plagues were not. Now, if we're going to understand that this was the unique uh, feature of the plague of the firstborn, then let's try and understand why Moshe displays anger at this point. You'll notice that the words that the Torah uses that he left Paro's presence, Bahari af, 
with anger. It doesn't say af Moshe Paro that Moshe became angry with Paro. It says that he left Paro's presence in anger. And it would seem to me that what the verse is suggesting is that Moshe displayed anger to Paro deliberately. And why did he display anger to Paro deliberately? Because he wanted to demonstrate to him what God was expressing. That when God expresses choriaf, the Torah describes God becoming wrathful. Well, God doesn't have emotion. What does it mean when God is wrathful? It means he's bringing retribution. And that was the reason why Moshe departed Paro's presence with wrath, not because Moshe he was emotionally unsettled or that he lost it, but rather because he wanted to demonstrate to Paro as God's emissary, that this is how God is, is, uh, is, uh, is behaving with you at this juncture. No longer is God presenting you with plagues in the hopes that you will repent, but now is God is the God of retribution. God is the God of choriaf, of wrath, and that's what you're about to experience. You will now experience the wrath of God, okay? And that's why Moshe uh, displays wrath at this point. So now that we understand why Moshe specifically displays wrath at this point, I hope that's clear. But now that we understand, I want to share with you a fascinating machloket between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish. There's a dispute between these two great sages, um, uh, and they live sometime in, I believe, the second century of the Common Era. Um, their debate is a debate, according to some commentaries, that recurs throughout their lifetimes within, and in their relationship with each other. So that this is a, t a, a quote from Tractate Zvachim, page 102. The Talmud had made a statement previously that says, anytime you find the term af, wrath, in the Torah, it leaves a mark. What that means is, is that there's some ramification of anger. Either someone experiences suffering as a result of that anger, or there's some kind of retributive after effect of that anger. And so the Talmud asks the question, is that really so? That anytime you, you find the term charon af, there's some uh, mark that's left? V'haketiv v'yetzei me'im paro b'chari af. Don't we see in our passage that Moshe walks out of Paro's palace in anger and didn't say a word to him? So what mark did Moshe leave on Paro to show his anger? That's the Gemara's question, right? So Amar Reish Lakish. So Reish Lakish says, Satro Vayetze, a shocking statement <laughs> that as Moshe was leaving, he slapped Paro across the face. That's the mark that Moshe left on Paro, is that he slapped him and left the mark from the slap on his face. It's a shocking thing. So the Gemara asks the question, how could Reish Lakish say such a thing? He seems to be contradicting himself. In, in last week's Parsha, in Va'era, God told um, Moshe to go meet Paro by the river banks of the Nile. Va'ama Reish Lakish, and Reish Lakish had said, was quoted as saying, Melechu v'haspir lo panim. Reish Lakish said, Paro is at the end of the day, whether you feel he's a good man or a bad man, he is a king, and therefore you have to show him the utmost of respect. So go to where he is and greet him at the river banks of the Nile. The Rabbi Yochanan Omar, Rashahu Vehaez Panechabo. And Rabbi Yochanan is the one who says that no, he's a wicked man, and you should show brazenness, be chutzpadik to him, because he's a wicked man, despite the fact that he's a king. So it seems like Reish Lakish takes a very deferential position. How could the same Reish Lakish say that Moshe slapped Paro in the face if he, if he feels that Moshe should have treated him like, like a king? So the Gemara says, Epoch. You have to say that we've got the opinions wrong. Reish Lakish is the person who says that Moshe had to be chutzpadik to Paro and be brazen and sharp and say, you're a bad man and I'm not going to show you any deference whatsoever. And it's, Reish La and it's Rabbi Yochanan, 
that Reish Lakish's counterpart, who is of the opinion that no, you need to be respectful to Paro, despite the fact that he is uh, a bad man. And despite the fact that he has murdered Jews and he has enslaved your people. Okay, so this is the machloket between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish. Now, according to Rabbi Yochanan, it turns out that when Moshe left Paro's palace, he did not leave a mark. He didn't say anything to him. The Sefer Haktava HaKabalah from Rav Mecklenburg of the 19th century says that how did Paro detect Moshe's anger if Moshe didn't do anything to him? So the answer is that normally when Moshe would leave Paro's presence, he would walk out backwards because it's not considered respectful to uh, show your back to the king or to any person, like if I were to be in an argument with you, and I would want to end the argument in a huff, in, because I'm, I'm upset, I would just turn around and walk away, and show my back to you. And that's considered disrespectful. So normally, when Moshe left Paro's presence after warning him, he would take his leave by taking steps backwards, never showing his back to the king. But because Paro had told Moshe, you will never see my face again, as soon as Moshe heard that, he said, you're right, I will never see your face again, and, um, and this is what's going to happen, you know, this is the last plague, and your people are going to beg us to leave, then he turned around so that he wouldn't look at Paro's face anymore, and then he walked out. But there was never any clear mark of his anger other than that. But Reish Lakish said he slapped him across the face, and when he went to see him even at the Nile, he spoke to him with great brazenness and opposition. I'm not going to go through this entire piece from the Avodas Yisrael at this point. We don't have time. But I just wanted to point out uh, something that is said by the Imre Emes, who was the Ger Rebbe until 1948 when he passed away. And in his commentary, the Ger Rebbe wrote, that B'nai Yisrael Nimnu, this is something that he writes in a completely different context about the census that is taken of the Jewish people in the book of Bamidbar. And he writes as follows. He says, the reason why Jews are counted in the Bible is that whenever you count something, you designate that something is important enough to you that you count it by number, then this indicates that it is something that is precious to you, and you never wish for it to be nullified. You never wish for it to be lost in a larger mix of things. The, and the, then he quotes the Gemara, that there's a machloket between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish as to whether something which is occasionally counted, but not always counted, is something that is subject to beetle, something that is subject to nullification by being part of a larger mixture. And Rabbi Yochanan says, only something which is always counted, something which is really, really important, that you always count it, you never weigh it, you never uh, uh, eyeball it, but you always count it one by one, that's something that can never be nullified. And Reish Lakish says that no, even something that uh, is occasionally counted, like the Jewish people, who aren't always counted by each one individually, but are occasionally counted, they are also of value, and they do not become bottle, they are not nullified. Now, that's a technical discussion having to do with the laws of, of Yantif, which we're not going to get into right now about an egg that's laid on Yantif and stuff like that. We're not going to get into that now. But the reason why he quotes this machloket between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish is that the Isa Ba'evodas Yisrael, that the Apterov in his commentary to Parshat Vayechi, that he's also known as the Magid Mikoznitz, he says that Rabbi Yochanan bechinas tzadik gomor, the Reish Lakish bechinas baltshuv. He says that whenever you see a machloket between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish, you can boil down their machlokes to the following a difference of attitude in life. Rabbi Yochanan looks at life as a tzaddik, a person who never was a bad person and rehabilitated himself. Rabbi Yochanan was a righteous person throughout his youth, into adulthood, and through his middle age and old age. There was never a time when Rabbi Yochanan had a lapse 
a moral lapse and he became a bad person and then had to become a Balchuva. He was always a tzaddik his entire life. And therefore, when he takes a position on something, he takes a position from the viewpoint of a tzaddik. And Reish Lakish bechinas Balchuva. And Reish Lakish, his view on life and on the human condition is as a Baal Teshuva, is as a person who is the person who knows what it is to be bad because he has a colored past, a checkered past, of not being a good person originally, and then was later rehabilitated. Now, where does the uh, Apterov, where was the, where does the Maggid of Kozhnitz know this from? He says that, um, you know, if you look at the story in the Gemara, the, the Gemara actually relates the story of how Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish met. Rabbi Yochanan was a great sage. He was a young, uh, a very handsome rabbi. And Reish Lakish, was a highwayman. He was a robber. He used to attack people with a band of thieves on the road and would steal their money and, uh, and harass them. And one day, Rabbi Yochanan is bathing in a lake and Reish Lakish comes upon him and they have a conversation. And through their conversation, uh, Rabbi Yochanan is able to convince Reish Lakish that he should rehabilitate himself. And it was only through that influence that Reish Lakish became a Baal Teshuvah. And Reish Lakish eventually married Rabbi Yochanan's sister and became the closest of friends with Rabbi Yochanan. They became chavrusas for most of their lives. And Reish Lakish, through his own personal life experiences, viewed the Torah through the lens of a Baal Teshuvah. Now, what does that actually mean? What does that actually mean, that he viewed the Torah through a lens of a Baal Teshuvah? Now, it could mean a number of things. First of all, it means that Reish Lakish was very much aware of how low people can go. And because he's aware of how low people can go, he feels that it's very important uh, to offer redemption to human beings who have gone to the lowest of lows, because he knows that if, we're, if it were not for uh, the opportunity that was afforded to me, I never would have been able to come and, and come under the wings of the divine presence. So on the one hand, he recognizes that every Jew, no one is beyond redemption, right? Rabbi Yochanan may take a, a more pristine position on certain things and may say that, you know, a tzaddik, a person who's never had any moral lapses in his whole life, that's the kind of person that you should strive to be. And we have this constant back and forth within the Talmud itself which is of a higher grade of, hum of human being? Is it the person who's never sinned, or is it the Baal Tshuva? The Talmud does say in one place that a Baal Tshuva occupies a station even higher than a tzaddik, because he's experienced all of the uh, indulgences, all of the, all of the pleasures of life, and has chosen to transcend those and to suppress his appetite, whereas the tzaddik may never have been tempted with those things. And that certainly colors a person's entire life. There's also something else in the attitude between a, a Balchuva and a Tzaddik. A Tzaddik may look at the world more through rose-colored glasses. And what I mean by that is Rabbi Yochanan looks at the human condition and he sees righteousness because he himself has been righteous all his life. So he has a much more optimistic opinion about the human condition. Reish Lakish, who's the Baal Tshuva, recognizes that human beings are not all they're cracked up to be, and that human beings actually can do really horrible things. And perhaps it's a reflection of his own image that he's seeing in the mirror, that there's a certain self-flagellation that the Baal Tshuva is constantly scrutinizing and reproaching himself, and by extension, reproaching everyone else. And that's sometimes why you find, even in our own experiences in life, that the Baal Tshuva may sometimes be more strict, be more harif, be more um, harsh in their attitude towards religious observance than a person who's what we call the FFB, the person that's been from their entire life. And the reason for that is, is that the person who's been religious their entire life uh, is comfortable uh, with the fact that they've had this lifestyle uh, their entire life and have not had 
the uh, the lapse, the moral lapses or the religious lapses that a Balchuva has had. And the Balchuva is constantly concerned about uh, recidivism and relapsing into a life of failure, life of, uh, of you know, falling off the wagon. And therefore they, uh, they are constantly concerned about you know, no, we have to do better, we have to be more strict, and we have to make sure that uh, everything is okay. And it also speaks to their attitudes about the human condition, that the Baal Tshuva is more pessimistic about the human condition, and the Tzaddik is more optimistic about the human condition. And it's in this light that perhaps we can take a look at the following, um, at the following Midrash. The Midrash relates another machloket between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish about God hardening Paro's heart. Uh, God says at the beginning of our Parsha, go to Paro for I have hardened his heart. Whoops, I lost that for a second. Here it is back again. That when God says I have hardened Paro's heart, this actually is a defense that Paro and, and, or, or heretics who wish to defend Paro would be able to give. If Paro's heart was hardened and he lost his free will, then how can you punish him? How can you legitimately punish someone who's never really had a chance to make their own free will choices? And the reason why Rabbi Yochanan looks at the attitude that way is that he sees that, you know, listen, people are basically good in their, in the, the human condition is basically good. And if Paro's heart was hardened, then that's the reason why he was so adamant in his refusal to let the Jews go, then it's not fair that God punishes him in the way that he's punished. But Reish Lakish's rejoinder to that is, Amar Reish Lakish, yisatein pihem shel minim, let the mouths of the heretics be silenced. And rather, im la, la leitzim hu yalitz, that if a person is lazy and, and filled with scoffery, then God will pay that person in kind. That God did not at all uh, do anything unfair to Paro. He warned him once, twice, three times. And if a person continuously refuses to heed God's uh, warnings and all of the, the signs that God sends him, you need to rehabilitate yourself. You need to do tshuva. Then God says, sorry, you didn't take the, the warnings that I sent you, and therefore I am closing up the doors of tshuva from you. And therefore, in order to uh, give proper retribution. So the way that the Ramban understands Reish Lakish's position is that God didn't harden Paro's heart and deprive him thereby of his free will. God actually provided Paro with the ability to resist the very, very strong warnings of the plagues and just restored his free will. It's not that God took away Paro's free will, but there was so much pressure from the plagues that if God had not hardened Paro's heart, Paro would not have had free will. And it seems to me that what Reish Lakish is essentially saying is that he's pessimistic about the human condition. And because of his pessimism about the human condition, it's not that God was being unfair with Paro, God was eminently fair with Paro because Paro had every opportunity. And it was only because of Paro's, just his malicious and, uh, and uh, you know, just mean-spirited character that he didn't want to listen to Hashem. And that's the reason why he feels that God was not in any way being unfair. This is a very important uh, machloket, because it essentially points to what type of attitude are we supposed to have with, with people who we find to be bad? The, once we understand this machloket between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish, in that context, we can understand why, according to Reish Lakish, Moshe is supposed to be a chutzpedik to Paro, why he's supposed to slap him on his way out, because Paro is a bad apple. He's inherently bad. And Rabbi Yochanan says, no, you've been a good person. And uh, people are inherently good. And, uh, and I have to show you honor, even when you're doing terrible things. Um, different attitudes in, in, in rabbinic literature 
to the very same experiences in life. Two people may be sitting across the table from each other and look exactly the same and may, may take two completely different positions about what's going on around them. And this is tremendously, I feel this is a very important insight into, into how different people view situations of evil within society and within individuals. And we should, we, there's a lot that we can learn, but we're out of time. So we're going to hold it here for today. I want to thank you for joining me. And uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.